Okay, good morning, guys. Hope you all had a good weekend. Let's get ready for the week ahead. And interesting start, certainly. Interesting developments over the weekend, certainly. Key information flow coming this week. And, you know, this this year, I think, will continue to remain a very interesting one. One thing to note, just before we get into the, the nitty-gritty here, it is a U.S. bank holiday today, so this afternoon um, might well suffer as a result of that in terms of, uh, well, certainly from a volume point of view. Um, and we'll see how we go with news flow and so on and some, uh, some, some market reactions, but it may well be that most of the price action, most of the movement, and therefore perhaps most of the opportunity today will come this morning um, rather than after lunchtime. So bear that in mind. But <clears throat> um, let's just look. Actually, I want to start. Let's go to a weekly chart for equity. And let's just have a look at the S&P here because um, what was... Let me just delete that. Time. What we had yesterday, uh, not yesterday, what we had last week, um, was yet another down day, uh, down week, of course. So we've had a, a brutal beginning to 2015. Um, Six percent down on the first full week of the year, and then last week, adding another two percent, pretty much. Now, we we made it through. If I just add a line in here, last week we kind of flirted with the September low, and we broke it, but in the end we closed back above it. We've had a decent response so far this morning um, but you've still got the key low of 2015 which is the August low um, down at 1831 that remains uh, untested as it stands but if I just measure from the top May 2015 the all-time high 2134 to last week's low then it is 13.3 percent this does mean of course that we are uh, intercorrection territory again, I guess you might say. Um, if you're measuring it from the most recent top, which was the November high, then uh, that's 12%. So, you know, we are into what's called official correction territory. That's 10% off recent highs. Um, so it's been a bit of a bloodbath, of course. So we'll see how this week gets going. But so far, the low of the week set the open or actually well in the first stages of the Asian session was uh, coincides with this low point from back in September 1860 so that still does remain a price point of interest as the a level we were looking at last week <clears throat> um, but let's let's talk about the main issue and um, I guess the main developments over the weekend I mean the, the, the two big forces this year are oil and China okay so Certainly, over the weekend, these can, uh, and this week ahead of us, these two should continue to remain as the big driving forces of global markets. Right? This isn't going to change. It might be we get to the ECB later on in the week, but for now, certainly the first half of the week will be business as usual, dominated by what happens in China overnight. Plus, what is you know how low can oil go? And um, over the weekend, key key developments then, and let's have a look just on the one hour chart here for crude oil because what happened at the open um, overnight um, was another big leg lower. It's actually, I, I would say, WTI crude has been pretty resilient in the face of what's been substantial downside for Brent crude. Um, WTI bottomed out here at 28.36 right at the open. Um, Brent actually got down to $27.70. So you do have an inversion of this spread. You know, we've had so many years now where Brent crude prices have been up and above, and actually, in some points, well above $10 above the price of WTI, but it's completely inverted now, and it is a fact WTI crude is now more expensive than Brent, which is the long-term average, um, which is the long-term norm. It's just we've had a, um, an abnormal few years. But heavy downside at the open, but actually, resilience here. Now what's happening, well of course it's it's mostly about the Iranian sanctions. So over over the weekend the um, well the nuclear related sanctions um, which have been in place 
since 2011 have been lifted. Uh, the 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 nuclear oversight team, or I'm, I'm not quite, quite sure what their official name is, but anyway, they were in Iran over the weekend, just um, having the final check on developments in terms of Iran dismantling their nuclear um, operations, and they have fulfilled their commitment. This is going back to, of course, the diplomatic process that took place last summer, and what happened was they came to um, a formalized agreement, but it involved six months' worth of um, activity from Iran to prove that they were serious and that they were going to fulfill their end of the bargain. And over the weekend, uh, they ticked the box. And so uh, sanctions are lifted. Now, this means they can now sell oil to anyone they want. And uh, they can sell oil well, in theory, at any price they want. So this is the kind of key development over over the weekend. Now, I want to show you a, a graphic here, because what does this mean for oil markets? Now, first thing to say, though, actually, is that this isn't like suddenly happened, and, oh, my Lord, now Iran are going to suddenly pump a huge amount more and this has not been priced in. I mean, that's nonsense. We've been knowing this has been coming for, well, for six months. What I would say is probably there's always been an element able to fulfill their end of the bargain, and so sanctions wouldn't be lifted. And then there was just an issue with the timing. You know, when would these sanctions officially be lifted? But that uncertainty, that was really the only uncertainty. I don't think it was a matter of, are sanctions going to be lifted? It was just a matter of when. And I would say it's happened earlier. It's probably happened at the first available opportunity, which um, for the skeptics has been a bit of a surprise. So I'd say the one thing about the developments over the weekend is it's happened probably at the earliest available opportunity, which, which is a surprise. Now, let's look at Iran's. Now, I apologize for the size of this. Can't seem to get this any bigger. But look, this is a... This is a graphic of Iran's production and exports. Okay, the blue line, the top line, is how much oil Iran produces, and the, the, the gray line underneath, that's how much they export. Now, sanctions um, actually hit in 2011, and this is where you can see the oil production take a pretty sharp drop, and it's been flat ever since. Okay, so US sanctions, actually, they've got March to June 2012 here, actually, okay. So sanctions at the beginning of 2012, taking production levels sharply lower, taking export levels sharply lower. Um, they have been able to sell oil, but only to a specific country. So during these years of sanctions, they have been able to export to the likes of India, for example, um, but not, you know, they, they haven't been able to export to Europe or, or the West generally. So to give you an idea, how much oil can Iran bring to back to the market here? Well. Um, you can see on this chart that, in theory, they could now return their export, or no, sorry, return their production levels back up towards 4 million barrels. You know, they were pumping 4 million barrels for, for between 2004 to, like, 2008. They were pumping 4 million barrels a day. They're down to below 3, okay? So the thought process is that they can immediately add 500,000 barrels to get them above 3 million again and then in time get back to 4 million, or just shy of it. So the idea is that Iran, in theory, could deliver a million barrels a day more to the market, but not straight away. Now, some people, and perhaps what's, and you know, this, this fact has been driving the price of oil lower. Let's go to the daily chart for crude. As I said, this isn't suddenly news, and wow, we need to price this in. This has been a lot of the situation that's that's been shaping the price of oil lower over the last few months. You know, the, these, these diplomatic efforts that took place back in the summer, you know, oil was up at 60 bucks. And then all of a sudden, wow, it surprised the world when the U.S. actually seemingly did the unthinkable and, and did a deal with Iran. Now, this took place in July. Now, what's happened ever since? Well, we've had massive downside. Now, sure. It's been helped to the downside by other factors, like China, for example, 
and that kind of risk and the continued resilience from the US shale industry. You know, these are powerful forces. Um, but it's certainly been helped along by Iran. So it's not like suddenly Iran something we now need to factor in. It's kind of already factored in. Now, here's the thought process. Now sanctions are lifted. All of a sudden, Iran are going to pump 500,000 barrels more a day. Now, I've got two problems with this view. Number one is a lot of these production facilities have been offline for four years. and it's not like suddenly you can flick a switch and they're suddenly back online pumping 500,000 barrels a day. You know, I'd say it's going to be fast, but it's not going to be immediate. You know, you're going to have find some inevitable problems from machinery that's been idle for four years. Um, I would suggest that it's not going to be quite as straightforward as flicking a switch. Secondly, who are they going to sell this stuff to? You know. The, the market's already oversupplied to the tune of 1.5 million barrels a day. So we've already got an oversupply. So you might say, well, this is more about how long will the oversupply last for? And sure, if Iran pump more oil here, well, maybe that oversupply can last for longer. But I don't think it's really going to change the fact that the market's already saturated. Who are they going to sell oil to? Now, what they could do is try and force themselves back into the market by, let's say, selling oil to, to Europe. And apparently, they've already got deals in writing with Greece and Spain. Apparently, also Turkey and South Africa are keen. I guess you're looking for the bargain hunters. You know, Can you force Iran's price down, um, knowing full well that they want to get back into the market? Maybe buyers can uh, use that leverage and, and um, force price even lower. So I'd say, Price being driven lower here uh, may well be all about the idea that maybe Iran are going to be happy to, to sell, sell their oil even lower, even cheaper than it is now. I would say that's unlikely. Um, Iran are feeling the pain, at the price of oil this low, like the rest of them. So appetite for you know cutting prices and, and having a sale from, from this point are unlikely. I'd say you're much more likely to see some kind of deal where um, Iran find new buyers in exchange for um, investment opportunities for international companies to invest in uh, Iranian uh, oil production facilities and they need it you know this is you know Iran for, for Iran to pump a million barrels extra this isn't going to happen overnight they're desperate for investment um, to you know, modernize their production facilities. So, you know, I'd say you might more likely see deals being done where um, you'll get Iran selling their oil to countries and um, where whose companies are interested in investing back in Iran. But, you know, the Middle East is very unstable at the moment. Outside of oil, just thinking about the geopolitics of it all, it's a very unstable environment. And I, I would say you're going to see the West being pretty cautious with regards to investing back in Iran. And so I don't think this is going to necessarily happen any, no, it's not going to happen quickly. Let's put it like that. I think what's interesting with oil today is given the big movements we had at the beginning of the Asian session overnight, as I said, Brent crude sharply down below 28 bucks. I think it's interesting that WTI has remained pretty resilient and we still trade 29 bucks. The fact that Brent has gone below WTI, maybe signals that there is some stability around this area for for WTI crude. We'll, we'll have to see, but um, we we do sit below 30 bucks. So if we go to the weekly chart, you know, make no mistake, this is heavily negative from a technical mm -hmm. point of view. Um, we we are down below the credit crunch low. Let me just sorry add a line at 30 bucks here, roughly. Let's just stick that in there. Just assume that's 30. So we're we're heavily negative. We're back to levels not seen since 2003, and so oil's on the back foot. But I would say seems pretty resilient here. Um, and 29 dollars is a key handle. We'll see if oil can get back up above that. Also, from an equity point of view, overnight um, Asia had a a very negative start to the session, um, and that saw that, and, and a lot of that was because of the oil move. So we 
Let me show you on the S&P one hour chart here. At the open, we had um, a bit of weakness where, where the S&P dived down to test 1860. But here we are 20 odd points and actually 30 points higher. If you look at the higher the day that we've just put in place um, over the last hour, um, 1890, that's 30 points off the opening low. So you've seen a, a, a pretty positive response here from equities, um, despite some severe weakness at the beginning of the Asian session. And um, there's been some action on China. Um, Chinese markets have actually been nice and positive. The rest of Asia dumped at the open because of the oil price and the Iranian sanctions being lifted and a bit of panic there at the start. Um, but ultimately, things stabilized, and actually Chinese markets had a good session. Shanghai Composite up, o up over 1%. A um, couple of things to note on China. Firstly, on their currency. Um, so the offshore yuan is 0.5% stronger this morning. So this is following news over the weekend that China is to raise offshore yuan reserve requirements for banks. And this is in a bid to bring some stability to the currency um, and to prevent excessive speculation. Um, the onshore currency rate was actually little moved. So um, you've got more efforts from the PBOC and the, and the Chinese authorities generally just to steady the ship. You know, it was them devaluing their currency um, in the first week of the year that really kicked off this aggressive cycle of risk off. Last week, the People's Bank of China kept the onshore rate fixed, unchanged for the whole week. And at the start of this week, they're active again in the offshore currency, um, again a sign that they're trying to stabilize things. So in the end, over the Asian session, you've seen the oil markets create pa panic at the start, but then ultimately the currency moves from China have stabilized um, sentiment a little bit, and you've actually seen a decent rebound in Asian markets, which has fed through to this move in the S&P that's taken us up to 1890 so far. Okay, so an interesting, we've almost had two halves to the Asian session, really. Panic at the start because of oil, and then reassurance because of China's action on currency. Okay, that kind of shapes up to actually in the end of a positive start in Europe, the DAX is up 0.9%, Eurostox up 0.85, for example. Um, let's just quite quickly go back to Friday because we, we've been talking so much about China and and oil, of course. But actually, if we go back to Friday's session where the S&P got killed, it has to be said, after the European close, touching down at 1850, I mean, we'd started the day at 1920. In one day, we went from 1920 to 1850, a 70-point sell-off. I mean, that is absolutely extraordinary. Then we got a rebound into the close, but it's not only oil, it's not only China. We then got a shockingly bad set of U.S. data. Um, let me just remind you of one of them here, which was the Empire State Manufacturing number that dived to minus 19 putting it at the worst level since March 2009. Now, I don't know how long you guys have been involved in markets, but I can tell you March 2009 happens to be the very low of the S&P in the financial crisis. It, it bottomed in that month, i.e. that was the very worst point of the, the carnage that was the credit crunch was in March 2009. This measurement, hasn't been this bad since that month. Okay, that puts that in perspective. The retail sales figures on Friday were bad. The ex autos and gas numbers coming in negative below expectation. The retail control group number very bad, minus 0.3%. We'd expected plus 0.3. You've got some pretty significant downgrades to quarter four growth as a result. The Atlanta Fed uh, GDP tracker is now pointing towards growth in quarter four of being just plus 0.6 percent. So really bad data from the U.S. on Friday, which was just adding to the to what was already a negative sentiment market. So we've got absolute carnage in in the U.S. session. We bounced into the close though and managed to close above 1860, which technically is important, and then. 
the China moves uh, have helped to just push things on again today. And I would also say stability of WTI crude should not be overlooked here in terms of helping this S&P market just stabilize and actually get a move on to the upside. Uh, on the oil front and on earnings, because we got more U.S. earnings this week, of course, Schlumberger earnings are on Thursday. This will be the big first sort of big oil giant to report earnings, and um, we'll see what they come in, come in with. Um, so, interesting times. Um, let's just have a look at what's on the schedule for this week. Uh, it's a U.S. bank holiday today. So pretty quiet, it has to be said. Let me just show you the calendar for today's session for what it's worth. There's not much on it. Um, in fact, all we've got is Italian trade balance, and then we've got some ECP numbers at 245. So these aren't of any note. So really, you can basically assume there's no data today. Okay, Certainly not this afternoon, because we've got the bank holiday in the US. Um, we've got some speakers, um, Bank of England, um, but they they had their meeting last week, so this is going to be particularly important, I don't think. And anyway, that's after the European close. So on the speakers front, quiet. And actually on the earnings, there's nothing today because it's a U.S. bank holiday. So you know this is an empty calendar. So there's nothing scheduled. Okay, bear that in mind. No scheduled news flow of any note. Um, however, later in the week and certainly overnight. It's going to be dominated by China news tomorrow morning because you've got all the key um, China data. We're going to get quarter four GDP. It's expected at 6.9%. We'll get Chinese retail sales figures. We'll get Chinese industrial product production figures. We'll get fixed asset investment data. So packed out Chinese calendar um, overnight. Okay, Actually, on the Chinese data front, and something also that's helped to just stabilize things, I think, and helped with the Chinese markets, is that we had good housing data from China overnight. Prices went up in 39 cities, which is up and above the print from last month, where prices went up in 33 cities. This is good, solid Chinese housing data. And I'll tell you right now, what's more important for the Chinese economy, the Chinese stock market, or the Chinese housing market, uh, in, and it is by far and away the housing market in terms of ha what, what impact that has on Chinese people. There aren't that many Chinese invested in their stock market, actually, relative, certainly relative to those that have um, investments in, in housing. So for China, it's the housing market that's more important. And good news on that overnight should not be overlooked either in terms of how um, in turn, you know, that's for the medium term. I know we've panicked a bit over this equity market collapse driven by exchange rate manipulation, but we've got six days in a row now where the Chinese have stopped um, devaluing their currency and are trying to stabilize things. And with positive housing data, you know, this shouldn't be ignored. Um, other stuff this week, I guess the other key thing to, to look for is the ECB. So we've got an ECB press conference um, and meeting on Thursday, um, and this is, you know, after the last meeting, which was at the start of December, where they disappointed. Here's an interesting graphic on this, looking at what people are expecting. So economists surveyed by Bloomberg, um, are the ECB going to do more this year? And 61% think yes, 39% think no. I am in the no category. Um, the people in the no, this no category has been getting smaller, of course, as we freaked out and had this risk off um, start of the year. The no camp is getting smaller. I'm still in the no camp, but we are in the minority. So 61% of people think that the ECB will do more. This bar chart is when will they do more. Uh, most think March, which is not this meeting, but the meeting after. And then you've got some coming at the next most popular is June. Um, how low can the deposit rate go? Remember, it's minus 0.3% at the moment, and um, the average thought is minus 0.5%. Um, so we'll see an update, an important update this week on the ECB. What do they think about the start of this year and the panic that's happened? What's their guidance going forwards? Are they going to 
guide us towards more stimulus is coming. They certainly did that in their October meeting, and then actually changed their course. In October last year, they properly stepped up the the promises we are going to do more, but by the time we got to the next meeting, they actually didn't really do that much more, and it was a disappointment. So maybe I think the ECB have learned a bit of a lesson there, not to be too aggressive on their promises. So that for that reason, I don't think you'll get. I think you'll get a hawkish meeting relative to market expectations when you've got most of the market, or not most, 61% of the market thinking they're going to do more. I think there's probably going to be a dovish outlook going into this meeting because of the risk off we've seen this year so far. And I think that ultimately the ECB will be cautious with their message, learning their lesson from not promising too much. I actually think you'll get, if anything, a hawkish reaction to the ECB meeting this week. But that's not till Thursday. So um, let's just focus in here today. Um, we've had this pop higher um, at the European Open. We've seen this rebound. In fact, oil right now is almost up to test the highs. We're just finding a bit of resistance still around Friday's low, 29.30. But oil looks like it wants to push on here, I would say. You've seen a rebound and actually positive territory across European and US equities. Um, thanks to this kind of China-led rebound. Um, all right, so no data. Um, your opportunities are most likely going to come this morning. Certainly keep things patient and cautious for this afternoon as we've got a U.S. bank holiday. All right, that's it for now, guys. Thanks a lot.